we will be in Matthew chapter 7. And we're continuing our study of the land of Jesus. The last couple weeks we've been in Capernaum. Otherwise known as Kafir Nahum, the village of Nahum, or the village of rest. Capernaum, a lot of stuff happened in Capernaum, right? That's the place where Jesus set up his ministry headquarters. Remember the location, Capernaum? The, it was located at the Via Maris, which is, was the international route, the trade route. It connected uh, three different continents. So that literally, that was the gateway to the rest of the world. So it was a little fishing village, thousand people, but I mean, the, where it was located was a perfect place for Jesus to set up his ministry because his message would be spread throughout all the world. So Capernaum, it was the place where Jesus performed miracles in the synagogue. He healed uh, Peter's mother, Peter, Peter's mother-in-law's uh, from her sickness. It's where he called several disciples. We read about Matthew. It's where he revealed his authority over sin. Remember last week, the paralyzed man, he said, your sins uh, be forgiven. Um, of course, he, uh, authority over sickness, authority over demons. He, re, he rebuked the, demo, the demoniac in the synagogue. It is a place where he upset the religious leaders. I mean, that's where he really started to stoke the fires of those Pharisees and Sadducees and all those religious guys. Today, we're going to continue looking around the Sea of Galilee. We're going to look at a couple more sites around the Sea of Galilee. And... Um, so talk a little bit, give some little fun facts about the Sea of Galilee. If if I was if I was told that you could you you go you can go to Israel, but you can only go to one place within a five mile radius, five to ten mile radius, anywhere in Israel, I'd want to be at the Galilee, even more than Jerusalem, actually. The Galilee is that it it's it's like you can just sense the presence of God. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you'll find out as you go, it's a hustle bustle poof, you know it's a lot but the galley it's calm it's serene uh the so much of it is undeveloped and so you know here's another interesting fact so uh, the first time i went over there i'm i'm thinking i would be building a house by the sea of galley <laughs> that's what <laughs> lake house mountain house but our tour our tour guide who's a jew said jews don't like living by the water so I'm like, you know, so so there's you don't see lake houses by the Sea of Galilee. It's interesting. There's hotels in Tiberias, but it's neat because it's so undeveloped. You can all you can picture it. You it, it's easy to immerse yourself into the Bible, into the stories of the Bible when you see the locations because there's there's nothing there, which makes it really cool. But that's why I love going to the Galilee because so much sixty to seventy percent of Jesus's ministry was around the galley. Almost everywhere you step, Jesus was there. Jesus did something there. And so that's what I wanted to show you a couple sites here. Um, little, little, um, little facts about the location. It's the uh, northern part of Israel. In the Bible, it's referred to as Lake Gennesaret. It's also referred to as the Sea of Tiberias. Tiberias is a, the, big, the big town uh, that, that was there. It's actually uh, Caesar actually build it uh, and that's where the hotels and so forth that's where the tours that's where you stay uh, when you go to visit Lake Gennesar it's also referred to as okay Gennesar G-E-N-N-E-S-A-R you'll see that in the gospels but also Gennesar G-I-N-N-O-S-A-R so those are some references uh, the reason it's called a sea is because in Hebrew there is no word for lake <laughs> it's a lake I mean, Mediterranean Sea, Atlantic Sea, Sea of Galilee. I mean, so the Sea of Galilee, it is only, to us, it's a lake. It's really, it's not that big. Let's see. It is, uh, da, 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 da. it's only eight miles wide and 12 miles long. Isn't that interesting? When you, when, first, when I'm, before I went there, I was thinking it was just this massive sea. It's a lake, eight miles wide, 12 miles long, 150 feet deep. I'm sure there's probably lakes in Colorado as big as that. I know in Florida there's a lot of lakes that are bigger than that. 
located 70 miles north of Jerusalem, 27 miles east of the Mediterranean Sea. It's located 700 feet below sea level. It's right at the edge of the Golan Heights. As a matter of fact, um, we'll put up a picture. I think I've got a, there's a picture of some of the sites we'll look at in just a second. Let's see. It's, uh, it's the main freshwater source for Israel. Because of the locations, there's cliffs around it and the below sea level, the mountains up high. It's just a weird location. So storms arise out of nowhere. <laughs> So when you read about the storms, Jesus walking on the water, I mean, it's amazing. It's like, whoom, just like that storms come out of nowhere, just the way, um, the way it's positioned. Uh, the main catch, fish, tilapia, known as St. Peter's fish. That's the fish that was caught. You still catch them today. That was the fish that was caught by the disciples. And it's the same fish Jesus multiplied to feed the 5,000. Um, just to give you an idea, yeah, there's the 12 miles and the eight miles wide. Most of Jesus's ministry was in the northern part. Um, Capernaum, see Capernaum at the very, very top. You got Capernaum. We're gonna look at uh, the Mount of Beatitudes today in the Sower's Cove. Uh, Bethesda or Bethsaida, that's up north, the feeding of the 5,000. You know where the, de the demoniac, today, you know, the demoniac that Jesus encountered, the guy, my name is Legion, you know, when Jesus, and we'll look at that maybe next week. So the, the town that that, that is called Cursey today. <laughs> Cursey, <laughs> where the demons were in Cursey, of all places. <laughs> Not Cursey, K-E-R, but it is, it's called Cursey today. Mount Arabelle. That's where uh, Jesus gave the Great Commission. Go you into all the world and uh, preach and teach Magdala, where Mary Magdalene is from. Uh, so um, the calling of the disciples. Tagba, that is where, that is where um, after Jesus was resurrected and Peter gave up. I'm done. I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I quit. He sees Jesus. He swims to the shore. That's where they were fishing all night, didn't catch anything. And so he swims to the shore and he falls down at Jesus' feet and, and says, you know, I'm, I'm here to serve you. Jesus said, do you love me? Yes, I love you. That's, that's where Peter was commissioned. Uh, Tagba is actually, uh, that's actually the, uh, one of the uh, miracles of the loaves and fishes were up there as well. So all that, that northern part, that's where most of the stories of, in the Gospels take place. Uh, let's see, Tiberias, this is the big one. This is where, when we go to Israel, we stay right on the shore in a nice hotel. That's the touristy area. Uh, Mount Arbel, you can go. Magdala, we'll go to Magdala. You still go there. Uh, there's an ancient synagogue. You see the remains. Uh, that's a fishing village, of course, where Mary Magdalene is from. The ancient boat, I don't know if, you, if you're into much history, but it made headlines when they found a 2,000-year-old boat. And that boat is on display. Uh, so all, pretty much all of that you can go to. Okay. Yeah. Is there still fishing there? Is there oh, yeah. Industry? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And you said Kersey was where he cast out uh, legion. The legion of demons, that was yes. The, uh, herd of swine, yep. Right? Yep. So that was What's that? That wasn't the Hebrews who were living there. They had swine. Uh, yeah, what's interesting is it's called the land of the Gadarenes. That land over there was, was a lot of Romans, a lot of Gentiles. So that was uh, basically Gentile, a lot of Gentiles. So that's why the, the swine. But yeah, it's a good observation. I think uh, I was going to talk about that this week, but I think I'll wait till next week uh, to show you where that took place because that's really, really neat. Um, let's see, you know what, let me pull up, let me see if I can, so maybe we'll just get off track a little bit, I can't pull it up, okay, do y'all want to see something cool, yes, I want to see something cool. 
because you asked about fish. You asked about fish. Okay, let me see if I can find something here. I'm going to have to wait. I'm going to, I, it's not. It'll be a surprise. We'll do it next week. We'll do it next week. <laughs> It'll take too long. to. I was going to show you. I will show you a guy throwing out the net and catching fish. So it'll be, it'll be neat. Okay. You know what? Let's just, yeah, we'll just continue. Okay. So anyways, with all of, with all of the, um, all of what's going on, everything Jesus did being at the crossroads, spreading throughout the whole world, Naturally, Jesus attracted followers, the crowds, because they heard of what Jesus did, his miracles, and also about his teachings. And so there's two main areas. We'll go, th we'll go through these pretty quick. Two main areas uh, that I, I'd like to show you. Put up the next picture where Jesus taught. So today we're going to talk about Jesus' teachings. And uh, the first one is the Mount of Beatitudes, Matthew 5 through 7, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And then there is the Sower's Cove. So the Mount of Beatitudes. Uh, let's see. The Mount of Beatitudes, it's located on a hill which overlooks the Sea of Galilee. And uh, put up the next picture, please. And there's actually a picture. Michelle took that picture overlooking. And this is actually the side uh, where it is to believe where the people were sitting and while Jesus was teaching. So you can see, you can see it's a beautiful view. I mean, imagine the scenery. See how it's, it's undeveloped. Um, so you can just picture, you know, how just the beauty and just as Jesus was, was speaking as well. Is there a reason why it's like unbuilt? I mean, it seems like it would be. I mean, besides the fact that trees don't want to live by the, the water. Yeah. Well, these are some farms. There's some farming through there. That's, it's the lush area. Uh, but there's so many archaeological finds that I think that has a lot to play into it as well. Like, I mean, you know, the his, Israel, the historical, yeah. Which, uh, but yeah, that's it. I mean, look, 2,000 years. I mean, I'm sure that's, <laughs> it doesn't look much different. Of course, I wasn't alive 2,000 years ago. But actually, I was actually told that even the erosion it's the same water level as what it was as well. So it really hasn't eroded. So it's pretty much stayed the same. So there's no climate change? <laughs> yeah. No climate change. Only in Colorado. <laughs> Only where, yeah. Well, no, come on, let's not talk it. Let's get back to, I'm already hot. My blood will really start boiling then, <laughs> right? Okay, here's something cool. Remember how we talked about churches? They put churches everywhere. So put up the next picture. Uh, there is a, that is the church. That church was built in 1938 for a Franciscan order of nuns. Now, I thought it was interesting. That is an eight-sided church. It's, it's shaped in an octagon. Why? Because there are eight Beatitudes. So I thought that was, that was pretty cool. I got a little video. I haven't showed you many videos. Of course, I've got tons of videos that I've taken over there. But um, I figure it might be neat for you to see a little two-minute video of me doing a little talk so you can just kind of get, get the idea. So here is, I'm reading the Beatitudes. And so uh, play, the, play the little clip there. Let me see. Welcome to the Mount of Beatitudes. And you can see in the background, you can see the Sea of Galilee. Hill, mountain, sloping down to the galley. This is where Jesus preached his first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. You know, the Beatitudes says this in Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And for the next few chapters, Jesus speaks kingdom principles. Kingdom principles. When I think of the Mount of Beatitudes, I think of kingdom living. Precepts for living. When Jesus, when he delivered the Sermon on the Mount, the, the Jews were under Roman oppression. They were looking for a Messiah, a king, to return and defeat the Roman Empire. But when Jesus spoke of the kingdom, he was looking way beyond that. Of course, he's referring to the millennial kingdom when he speaks of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. But also, more specifically, he's referring to a spiritual kingdom. When Jesus is giving kingdom principles, they're thinking, oh, kingdom, uh, Jesus is setting, a, uh, the king is coming to set us free from Roman oppression. But Jesus is saying, no, I want to have rule in your heart. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It's about Jesus uh, having your heart, kingdom, your heart being a domain for the king. And so this beautiful setting with the backdrop, you can just imagine the multitude as Jesus proclaim these kingdom principles for the first time they're hearing this and they're amazed that Jesus is speaking with all authority all power he's the king he's the king and it's his kingdom and he wants complete control of our lives that's it so uh so yeah Matthew 5 through 7 the Beatitudes of course there's so many lessons and uh, that's that's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. It's about kingdom living. <laughs> it's about kingdom. It's a domain for the king. And uh, so you can just imagine. I mean, this is, I mean, mind-boggling. This is a paradigm shift when Jesus is preaching. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, some theologians speak the law was given, and they, they believe the law was given on a mount, was given on a mount, and on the Sermon on the Mount, that's when the law was fulfilled. And so there's some believe that. Uh, let's look at Matthew 7, 24 through 29. And I figured this would just be a good little, this is a good summary of the Sermon on the Mount. And by the way, if you haven't read the Sermon on the Mount, that'd be a good reading plan for this week. There's so much, so many lessons in that sermon uh, but it says in Matthew 7, 24 through 29, this is the summary of the whole sermon. Jesus said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock, on a foundation. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rain and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it'll collapse with a mighty crash. So he's summing up uh, this, this sermon with two, talking about two builders, the wise man who builds the house on the rock and the foolish man who builds the house on the sand. Building on the rock, what do you think that represents? Building on Jesus, listening to the words, obeying the words that he just said, <laughs> which is building on the words of Christ. Yeah, when you're building, building on the rock means you're, you're obedient. Basically, everything that I just said, do it. <laughs> do it. And that shows your obedience. Uh, the, the foolish man is disobedient. Doesn't obey the word. Is disobedient to the words. Uh, they're the ones that you know, the word goes in one ear, out the other ear. You know, you're just dismissing it. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. A couple quotes that I read this week uh, from some theologians that I study. Uh, one said, the greatest need of so many Christians is not to know more Bible, but it's to obey what they already know. <laughs> You know, some people just want to learn, 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 learn. But if you're not obeying it, you're just like the Pharisees. You just have knowledge. 
Another uh, author said, spiritual growth is more than just knowing more. It's obedience to what you know. And so, uh, I mean, think about that. Spiritual growth is not just knowing more. What do you, who do you think is more spiritually mature in God's eyes? The one that's been saved for 30 years, knows all the Bible, can quote it, is doing everything in the church, he's doing this, but who's in sin and has a bad attitude, is spreading strife. Or the one, maybe you've only been saved for a year, but don't know that much Bible, but you're living for the Lord, you're humble before the Lord, you're spreading the gospel, you're loving others. Who does Jesus consider to be spiritually mature? That one. Think about that, you know, because we're the religious world says spiritual maturity is all about knowing, 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 knowing. But Jesus, like spiritually mature, the spiritually mature person is the one that's doing it and loving and serving and caring. And so uh, that's what that's what how Jesus is summing this up, that that's the one who is building upon the rock. All of these principles, Jesus talks about, you know, the Beatitudes, he talks about living by faith. He talks about worry, you know, not worrying. He talks about being obedient. It's the one, uh, he talks about adultery and lust and, and all of that. He says the one who does the word, that's the one who's building upon the rock. Um, why a spiritually mature person will do the word and live by and apply it to their life. So Jesus, he's saying that the foundation for our security and the stability is to do what the Word says, to do the Word of God, and also to apply these principles, these kingdom principles, uh, to our life. Uh, verse 28 says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. See, the teachers of the religious law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they weren't speaking out of their own authority, they were speaking from someone else's authority. They were just quoting the Torah. They were quoting um, what other people have said, other scholars have said. So they had no authority. But here is Jesus who is authority. I mean, he is speaking with all authority as the Son of God. And so think about, think about everything that we've seen like around Capernaum, around the Sea of Galilee. At Capernaum, Jesus revealed his authority over sin. He revealed his authority over the devil. He revealed his authority over sickness. He revealed his uh, authority over all powers and, and demons. At the Mount of Beatitudes, Jesus revealed the authority of his word. So that's what I think of when I think of the Mount of Beatitudes. Kingdom living and where the authority of his word was revealed. And so um, the word, the word of God. Of course, he is the word made flesh. Any, um, I'll show you the cove of the sower. We'll look at uh, Mark 4. But anybody have any thoughts, any questions, any observations? That'd be a good little study this week. If you're looking for a little, little Bible study, a little something to read, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Man, every time I, I look at those chapters, man, they just speak to me. They speak to me. Okay, well, we'll quickly, we'll look at a, another place, the Cove of the Sower. There's, put up another, the other map. Okay, so this would be a aerial, but basically this is from the Mount of Beatitudes looking down, and the Sower's Cove. I'm sure. Um, yeah, I'm almost positive they they would be. Yeah. Yeah, the original way. Um, yeah. I mean, every 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 step is something. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. That's just a that windy road. That's your main road. That road will go all the way around the lake, or once you get up to the headwaters up here around Bethsaida, that's when it starts to shoot up. Then you head up to the, the Golan Heights, to Caesarea Philippi. Uh, we'll look at that. Dan. You know, I was thinking, uh, we're coming up on Easter so so quick, and there's so much around the Sea of Galilee, but I thought it maybe it'll be neat um, 
as we get up to Palm Sunday, we're talking today about the road of Palm Sunday. Uh, would you like to see that road? Maybe we do that around Easter. It's, let's look at some of those things. Let's look at the, the Palm Sunday where, uh, where Jesus, where he stopped and he wept over Jerusalem. We've got pictures from that place. And, and uh, as we get into Easter, yeah, why don't we look at Calvary? And wouldn't you like, that'd be, that'd be good to look at that now. Then we'll get back to the Galilee. But maybe the next couple of weeks we'll look at some of those sites in Jerusalem. But uh, yeah, let me show you this, the, so, the Sower's Cove, because um, this is, I want, I want to read, let me read uh, Mark 4, 3 through 9, and this goes along with the, um, with the word, with, with uh, Jesus speaking and, and the authority of his word, and see if you recognize the, uh, no, wait a second. I got pictures. I got pictures of this. Let me show you some pictures. Okay. Actually, Mark 4 1. I'm confused. Okay. It's probably because I'm hot. That that air is coming off of this thing. All right. So let me read something here and then I'll show you a picture. Okay. Now that everybody's confused, including me. Mark 4 1. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. Okay, I wanted to set that up. This is what we're going to look at. He taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. This place, Sower's Cove, it's not a, um, it's not a tourist place. It's, it's not marked. Um, I just happened to do some research on it. And actually, people don't even know it's there. And the way that I found it was basically just researching, looking online, Google Earth, honing in, dropping the coordinates, you know. And, but, but really, I, I wanted to find this place because, I mean, think about such a significant place where Jesus was on the, in the water preaching to the multitudes. And this was at the bottom. And also, I wanted to try the acoustics out. Yeah, and it is the way it is positioned. You can talk, and it's it's almost like an amphitheater setting from from the lake itself. And when you talk, you don't have to scream and holler, but you can hear way up by the road. So I just thought it was just cool. So we wanted to find this place. So um, you know what? Put up the video, and then we'll read the the parable. So there's another little video. You're at the cove of Mark chapter four, and you hear the wind. It might be kind of hard to hear, but it's on the water, speaking to multitudes that were gathered right here. This cove right at the north northeastern side of the lake. And down at the edge of the water, the acoustics are so great when you're when you're talking, it amplifies all up through here. But in Mark 4, he he's this is uh, he's telling parable after parable the the kingdom parable, mustard seed, the sower goes out to sow. And then as soon as he finishes, he says, let us go to the other side. And him and his disciples, they get in a boat, right in the cove. And they actually head to the west side, to the northwest side of the lake, to Kersey, where which is called the land of the Gadarenes, which is where they would meet uh, the man with the... Uh, Demonic, the demonic spirit. And right in the center of the lake is where the storm came. And of course, Jesus saw the water. This is the cove of the sewer. Right here. Right in between um, Capernaum. It's right up, it's right up, uh, it's probably 100, 200 meters. And then right down this way, down this way is Hagma. Uh, So, yeah, it's pretty windy. Yeah, it's pretty windy. But it just goes to show you, if you see the map, all of that's confined within a matter of like a, an area of two miles three, from the Mount of Beatitudes down to the cove to Capernaum. So all it's just 
small, you know, just confined to a small, to a small area. But I thought you'd like to see, you know, how the the landscape and. Um, but anyways, let's let's close up by reading uh, Mark four. Let's see. We read about he he told them stories. He told them parables, because I think you'll be able to see how this ties into the. The scripture we read from Matthew, Mark 4, verse 3. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed as he scattered it across his field. Some of the seed fell in a footpath and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun and soon, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So he speaks of four places, four areas where seed are sown. And he told, he, he, he told this in, in a story. The people didn't understand what in the world is he talking about. What's he talking about? So he goes to explain, verse 14, he explains uh, what the meaning is to, the, to his disciples. The seed represents the word. The four places that the seed was sown represents four different kinds of hearts. And so in verse 14, it says, the farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. So he's sowing the word. He's speaking the word, okay? The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. This is the hardened heart. This is the one that doesn't receive the word of God. You know, the soil has to be prepared and plowed. I mean, this is rock. This is rocky soil. So this, this, this heart instantly resists the word of God. That's the first type. Verse 16, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. So you have the hard heart, but then here's the shallow heart. It's like soil with no depth. The, the roots, you know, if you just have shallow soil, the roots aren't going to go deep into the ground. So this is the roots of the word uh, aren't established in this type of heart. This represents uh, the, the person that maybe they, they say yes for a short period of time. But then when times get tough, oh, you know, they lose heart. They lose, they lose faith. They give up. So that's the shallow heart. Verse 18, the seed that fell among the thorns represent others who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. So this is the crowded heart. So you have the hard heart, the shallow heart, and the crowded heart. Uh, this is all kinds of thorns, the cares of the world. You're, you're more concerned about making money. You're concerned about just satisfying all your worldly desires. All of that choke is choking out the word here. Then verse 20, And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a, har produce a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as has been planted. This is the fruitful heart. This is the fertile heart. And so this is the one that receives the word, that is bearing fruit. This is the, the obedient, the one who is obedient and is, doing the, is a doer of the word. So which kind of heart are we supposed to have? The fertile heart, right? The fertile, the, the, the fruitful heart. So can you, can you see the correlation between Matthew 7? It's all about receiving the word. And it's all about receiving the authority of, of God's word through Christ. Uh, they're both about receiving the word. They're both about obeying the word. Matthew 7 is about building on the right foundation. That's where our security comes from, obedience to the word. Mark 4 speaks of being the right soil. It's still about receiving the word, still about, uh, about obedience to the word. And so uh, we'll stop right there. But the Mount of Beatitudes and the Cove of the Sower... This is the place where the authority of the word of Christ was established. So maybe as you read through the, read through uh, your own study of Mark 4 and Matthew um, 
five through seven. Maybe you'll remember this little lesson and picture the picture the, the scenes of the Galilee. Any questions? Any observations? <laughs>